We go now from Maui to end today's show looking at how the deadly wildfires that spread through Maui came after weeks of worsening drought conditions as the climate emergency fuels deadly fires across the globe. The U.S. Drought Monitor reports nearly 16 percent of Maui County is now facing a severe drought, an additional 20 percent is facing moderate drought. We're joined in Honolulu by Clay Trauernicht, professor in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Management at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where he focuses on wildland fire management in Hawaii and the Pacific. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Clay Trauernicht. It's great to have you with us. Put these two issues together. You have the hurricane, hundreds of miles away, creates hurricane uh, winds um, that fuel these wildfires, and how this is connected to climate change. Yeah, thanks for having me, and uh, I'd just like to say how much I appreciate you um, highlighting the voices of your of your prior guests to uh, kind of round out the perspective on this this incident. But in terms of these um, the climate or weather events that we've seen, um, we had the combination of the storm passing to the south and this high pressure system that really ramped up winds and um, uh, lowered relative humidity. Uh, over the course of a couple of days. And, and what's really important to understand is that those really rapid changes in weather um, can have huge effects on fire danger. But the reason that they're having the effects they are is because of the landscape scale changes um, that your prior guests were mentioning. And that's the, the change in the vegetation surrounding um, the community in Lahaina, as well as the community upcountry Maui, which was experiencing similar fires um, and is still, which are still burning right now and these are uh, changes that have affected uh, most of the most of the island uh, in the in the in the state in the sense that these change in land use over the past couple decades the decline in agricultural production ha has really resulted in the dramatic expansion of these non-native tropical grasses and and this really creates th this vulnerability that we're seeing right now and and the um, you know the, the really explosive growth in fire uh, that that we, we saw over the past couple of days were you surprised by the scale of this disaster? And now this debate over where were the early warning, you know, so many deaths, and there are probably a number more, um, how it could uh, have been dealt with in a different way? I mean, you have the governor saying this is the worst um, uh, natural disaster in Hawaii's history. Yeah, I—, I... I think we're clearly grappling with the human toll. This is something that's absolutely unprecedented. And I don't think, I mean, just the loss and hearing these stories that you of your of your prior guests, I mean, it, this is gonna it's still sinking in for all of us just how dramatic this is and, and just what it, the impact that this has had on, on the people, like first of all, first and foremost. Um, as far as the uh, unprecedented nature of these fires. Unfortunately, this is something we've been seeing over the past decade at least. Um, and we can look back to uh, 2019, where 21 homes were lost in West Maui due to similar fires. Um, the same year, we had about 20,000 acres burned through central Maui. Um, 2018, we actually had a near pass of, of another hurricane system that uh, coincided with large-scale fires on uh, Oahu, uh, on the west side of Oahu. And in each of these incidents, what we're seeing, uh, I think, as your first guest mentioned, is our uh, the, the firefighters we have on the ground. That those are the resources we have. They were spread incredibly thin over this past week. They're you know doing everything that they can. And as far as what we can do, and by we I mean the the the, the response agencies that we work with, the nonprofits, Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization, I have to give them credit too. But we're trying to get the word out um, and identify the actions that communities and land managers can take uh, prior to, to these fires and so that we can reduce risk, create safer conditions, and, and sort of relieve the burden, which at this point really falls onto our emergency responders. Um, another element or dimension to this change in land use or the the um, limited uh, limited management we see on these on these lands, these these tropical grasslands that cover the state is about a million acres, is that 
as those operations uh, have kind of removed from the landscape, you lose a lot of the knowledge that was there from the workers who uh, knew where the roads were, were maintaining the roads, maintaining water access. So again, all of this burden uh, falls on our firefighters, um, and we're, we're asking them to do really heavy lifting. And up until this incident, we also have to say they've done a commendable job um, of really protecting our communities. This is, uh, as you said, this is the worst we've ever seen, and all of the fire that we have seen over the past um, couple decades since, since agriculture has been declining, our, our firefighters are typically very successful at, at protecting homes, uh, infrastructure, and human lives. Professor Tronick, uh, President Biden has pledged disaster relief, immediate assistance to those affected. But what would it mean if he actually outright declared not just a state emergency in Hawaii, a national climate emergency, a national state of emergency? It's a difficult question for Hawaii. Um, we struggle here having uh, long-term funding in place. And part of that reason, as far as the relationship with the federal government, and again, I can only really speak to the fire realm, fire management realm, is that um, we don't have these large tracts of federal land. Uh, and that's usually the mechanism through which, um, you know, National Forests, Bureau of Land Management, these are the mechanisms, uh, at least in the continental U.S., that, that uh, funding kind of comes in for this kind of work. And what we're talking about um, for a disaster like this, to pre prevent the next one, is to support these efforts on the ground that are actually altering the condition of those fuels. And there are lots of examples, lots of people working on this, ranging from working with ranchers to do targeted grazing, um, doing fuel break networks to give firefighters a fighting chance, uh, re-implementing traditional agriculture. There's examples of folks um, restoring taro, low-E wetland taro, to actually act as fire breaks, uh, all the way through to reforestation, where we're converting these fuels uh, into something else, something less likely to burn. And I think, you know, our job, the, what we've been working on, the folks uh, doing fire prevention work for, for the number of years now, is just how do we scale this up? And so that's really what we need to be thinking about uh, with assistance from the federal government, is how can we implement these actions that and the knowledge that people already have, how can we do that at, at larger scales, coordinate across uh, bigger, bigger well, spaces? Uh, and, and this is something that needs to happen statewide. Professor Clay Charonek, we thank you so much for being with us from the University of Hawaii in Honolulu. That does it for our show. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.